Hello and welcome to a webinar on Afro South Asia as part of a series of intellectual interventions for the Black Story Project, a virtual interactive exhibition to examine, explore, and embrace the historical ties between Black and South Asian communities. I am Nahar Khan and I thank you for being here with us today. We'll be joined by researcher, archivist, and curator, Dr. Kenneth Robbins. Dr. Robbins is a collector and an independent scholar. He has curated more than a dozen Indian exhibits and five scholarly conferences. In addition to publishing more than 120 articles, he co-edited a three volume series on Afro South Asia in the global African diaspora, African rulers and generals in India, African diasporan communities across South Asia and black ambassadors of politics, religion and jazz in India. Dr. Robbins, I thank you for being here with us today. Thank you. You have co-edited one of the most comprehensive accounts on the experience of the African diaspora in South Asia, which gives us an enthralling insight on the role of Africans in shaping South Asian history and the interactions between the two communities. Take us through the three volumes and the idea behind your work. The idea behind my work is that to work from objects and from articles and so on and so forth, rather than start with the narrative and try to find ways of confirming that narrative. And what I found is that there are really at least four different separate divisions. One is the history of the accomplishments of elite Africans, which I think are very great uh, in South Asia, considering the numbers of people who were involved which surprised a lot of people, doesn't surprise me, but does surprise a lot of people. Second, the poor communities, which are mostly Muslim, but not all Muslim in South Asia today, uh, which range all over the place from uh, Gujarat and Karachi uh, to uh, south of India. Uh, and the third is seeing African, people of African origin, not as just as victims, of a slave trade, not ignoring the slave trade uh, and talking about its evils, but also seeing blacks as people who have done things on their own and who interact with different people of African origin across the globe and to focus on that as well. Those are three separate stories I've covered. A little bit I've covered on the question of colorism and racism, but I think that this has to be the next volume when focusing totally on that. I see that uh, you have, um, you know, referring to this fascinating map you have in your first volume, are you able to take us through how people traveled from different parts of Africa, namely East Africa to different parts of South Asia, because they come in as merchants, sailors, and soldiers as per your volume, but to rise to great positions of power, becoming rulers and generals. Can you tell us about this from your research? What we have is a situation where the earliest definite information that we have are some coins, Aksumite coins, African coins found in India. But we assume that there for at least 2000 years, long before Europeans were involved in it, there was trade across the Indian Ocean. And the question is, how in what ways do you document it? So the first question of documentation has to do with the most obvious thing. The, uh, we cannot ignore the question of slavery. But when we consider the number of slaves that were traded across the Indian Ocean, we see that it was pretty much the same as the number of slaves that was traded across the Atlantic. But of course, that period of time where slaves were being exported across the Atlantic was far shorter. So let me say this a different way. By the eighth century, Africa was an important source of slaves for South Asia. The total number of slaves exported through New World in about four centuries was about 12 and a half million. We think about 12 and a half million is probably right for the number of slaves traded to Asia, the Persian Gulf and the Red Sea areas. And during the period 1600 to 1900, about five and a half million slaves were traded. Now, the history of this slavery is like in South Asia, for example, is quite different. But slavery is not limited to people of African descent. The things that we see are mainly 
deal not with plantation workers, but with domestic and military servitude. And most importantly, slaves could obtain manumission and upward nobility. And we're going to describe some fantastic cases uh, in the 17th century where sl slaves, people who were born as slaves, achieved great prominence politically and militarily, something that would be unthinkable in 19th or 20th century, early 20th century America. Also, we have the idea that many Africans came as traders and sailors and soldiers and concubines and other things. They didn't all come as slaves. So if you go back to look at this map, you see that it comes all over. It's all along the East African coast and it's all along the Indian coast. And a lot of the trade is through the Red Sea and so on. And what you get here is the interconnectedness of the whole Indian Ocean including the Middle East, East Africa, India, and then on further to Southeast Asia. That's fascinating. And I, I really want to come to the infamous trader Baba Gore in just a moment. But there is a, a fascinating Mughal painting where we see major figures that are African. How does this relate to Islam? And what are your findings on this, Dr. Robbins? Well, this is a very famous painting. It's in the Freer Museum at the Smithsonian. And uh, I was looking at it for purely for, to understand the painting and from an aesthetic point of view and only secondarily to understand who was in the painting. And I look at it and the smack of all the greatest Islamic scholars in the Mughal Emperor in the 17th century, there are two guys who are obviously African. You see them on the right-hand side. I don't know who they are yet, but we're going to find out who they are. And what this is opened a whole question about where do we find other Africans, people of African origin related to Islam in South Asia. And so in the book, we talked about some of the even earlier clerics that may have come from Africa to South India. So it opens a whole question there. And the second question it opens is, the question of elite Africans in the courts of uh, the various Muslim rulers, not only the uh, Mughals, but also the, uh, particularly in the Deccani Sultanates, where we have a tremendous preponderance of Africans who really created so much in the history of India. Moving uh, towards, you know, we hear stories about the infamous trader Baba Gore, who established the agate trade, which started in Ratanpur of Gujarat. Can you tell us about him and how he's uh, revered today within the existing um, African descendant communities across South Asia? And also, what did it mean for the Indian Ocean trade routes? Right. Well, he's very often credited with coming to Africa, from Africa to India and establishing in Gujarat. Uh, the tremendous agate trade that came through the great port of Cambay, and uh, there were mines in places near Ratanpur and so on and so forth. We don't really have any historical data, but this is not unusual with Sufi states. And some of the other areas that I'm working on, really one of the questions has come about whether one of those Sufi saints really actually was a person who existed. So there are all sorts of stories that are, uh, have come up. His name may have originally meant the father of deep thought, and it's later been corrupted to father of the grave. And in today, you still see Baba Gore shrines in many places like Am Amdabad, uh, and, uh, and the, the primary one being in Ratanpur, um, and Jambor, and so on and so forth. So all across Gujarat, there are Africans still at shrines related to Baba Gore. There are also shrines to his sister, my Misra, and to also to his brother as well. So this is a particularly interesting thing because we're not talking about somebody who comes as a slave. We're talking about somebody who not only comes as a trader, but somebody who creates a whole industry, which is a sustaining industry in Gujarat for, for centuries. 
Yeah, I think it's fascinating that he remains, uh, his remains are entombed in the shrine at Rothanpur today and that he remains a protector of the Sidi community and is highly revered. We see um, other structures and symbols left in South Asia by Africans uh, during that time, such as the Sidi Said Mosque of Ahmedabad. Are you able to tell us a little about those structures? And, yes, and- um, in the sultans of Gujarat, were defeated by, in 1573, by the Mughals. But before that time, we have a whole series of uh, mosques and tombs and so on and so forth, which are related to elite African figures. Uh, And for example, in the greatest uh, Sufi complex uh, in Ahmedabad, there are the the Sidi or East African, in this case, uh, Hapshi uh, tombs. There's also this mosque built by Sidi Said, and he, as the plaque in the mosque says, he was an Abyssinian, okay, and he joined the personal retinue of Bilal Jaja Khan, who was a famous Abyssinian general. Sidi Said was a learned man, had a valuable library, and so on and so forth. Now, this particular mosque is particularly interesting because it has these wonderful stone windows, incredibly beautiful, among the most beautiful stone carvings in the world. And they are also considered the symbol, like uh, the Eiffel Tower is in uh, Paris. Uh, They are the symbol of Ahmedabad. And that's not the only mosque related to an African. Uh, My favorite is uh, a mosque that doesn't really exist anymore, but you can go to the minarets and uh, it in the past, you could shake one of the minarets and the other minaret would shake. And this is the mosque of Sidi Bashir. But what I found is that Africans were building mosques and things like that all across India. And the one that's the greatest is a place called Bijapur. And in the Jami Majid, Yakut Dabali Hapshi builds this Jami Majid. And we've discovered any number of other uh, mosques and things built by Africans, uh, including Malik Sando. Uh, so we see them involved in mosque building. We see them as judges. We see them as Sufis. And I think this is the most interesting picture of how they're integrated. This is a mogul picture. And it has been described as a picture to show every kind of Hindu and Muslim holy man you you could possibly imagine the idea of a synthesis and supposedly they're meeting at a, it's not an actual meeting, but it's a meeting of people from the past and present from every kind of religious pursuit you can possibly imagine meeting at the Ajmer Sharif at uh, the Dargar, uh, Shisti Dargar and smack at, is at the top is a line of Muslim and right in the center is an African. How does this happen? I don't know who he is yet, but we're going to find out. And where did you collect this uh, particular piece of art from, or where is its present location now? Well, so when I say my collection, I do have a lot of things. Uh, This one I don't have. This is in a museum in Britain, Mm -hmm. and it's one of the greatest of mogul paintings and and one of the most valuable ones in terms of collectors. Uh, I think it's great from a historical point of view and from an aesthetic point of view. It's a key mogul painting. Wow, that's fascinating. Dr. Robbins, you have archived a vast number of art from that time period, where we see paintings of African military heroes, generals, and rulers. Can you explain your findings on the particular artwork that you've come across? How can you tell Indians from Africans, and what is the construction of race and color depicted through the paintings? Are the depictions accurate? What are your findings? I think they vary. First of all, we have paintings from, in this case, from 1750, from a place in Western India, Hindu ruler, and we can see there are five Africans. One is wearing a typical hat associated with a particular type of African. It's a red hat. In the right bottom of the painting, uh, you see four more Africans, and they're not wearing the specific red hat. And we found in the armies of a lot of the rulers, Hindu and Muslim, that there were these soldiers. They were also 
in the armies of the Deccanese Sultanates. Here's another painting in the collection. This is of the son of Aurangzeb before he himself became emperor, uh, leading an army. And in the middle of it, there are scattered Africans. And in the pictures from Bijapur and Golconda of this period, of the uh, 16th hundreds and the 1700s, we also see Africans scattered. We do also know that there were groups of Africans where the whole groups were Africans. This came to head in the 19th and 20th century in Hyderabad, where one of the substates, one of Pathi, uh, imported Africans to form an army. And then that army went over to become uh, the African guards of the Nizams of Hyderabad. And so here are the pictures. What was interesting to me is that the Africans didn't, weren't only soldiers. And over and over again, we saw Africans who were military leaders. Probably one of the most important was the General Hush Mohammed Shidi, who was considered a great Sindhi patriot and was a general against the British of the Emirs of Sindh. And he uttered his famous words, I will die, I will die before I give up Sindh. So it's an African who is protecting the local people. And you'll see this with Malik Ambar as well, where even non-Muslims consider him a defender of the Deccan. Malik Ambar is one of the most famous people amongst Africans in South Asia, who went from being enslaved to being the most powerful man in India, who transformed himself into a king in all but name. He had a stronghold on Ahmednagar, and after the death of his Hapshi master, he became the de facto king of Ahmednagar. Tell us about Malik Ambar and also the confrontations he had with an expansionary Mughal empire. We do know that he probably uh, came from the Oromo people in Ethiopia. He came as a slave, but an elite slave, a learned man, and he eventually became the master of Ahmednagar. So in this early 18th century print, uh, he is described as the protector of the kingdom of the Deccan against the Mughals. Um, and so what's important about this picture is they describe him as a miserable slave as well. But he doesn't look like a miserable slave to me. In the history, I'm going to just skip down to say there was a queen and she was overthrown by a different group, which included an African leader. Then another fellow, Genghis Khan, who was probably an African, took over. And there are a number of Africans who took over after that point as the, uh, as the people who were actually managing the state. So among these leaders were Genghis Khan and Jamo Khan. A queen took over and her councils included a number of Africans, her prime minister was Abhang Khan, and so on and so forth. But from 1600 to 1626, Malik Ambar, this African, was campaigning against the Mughals, and he prevented them from conquering Abu Dhabi. He held his own. He built a new city, which later became Aurangabad. Uh, he set up a whole new administrative tax collection system. And he also was one of the creators of the great kind of guerrilla warfare, which was perfected initially by him and his troops, which consisted, uh, included not only Africans, but also Marathas. And what's important to understand is that in Abid Nagar and Bijapur, that Maratha leaders worked under these Africans, including Shivaji, Shivaji's father, grandfather, and so on. He created this new city, which is now Aurangabad. And he was such a difficulty for the Mughal emperor that the Mughal emperor made a picture of him, self, shooting an arrow through Malik Ambar's head. Never could catch the guy. And even in the 19th century, uh, when there was a nationalist movement, pictures of Malik Ambar were still being made. So here's a print uh, from my collection, a late 19th century print. After Malik Ambar's death, his son became the prime minister. And it goes on and on and on. And 
see a list of other Africans who were involved in the history of this place until the state ended. But it wasn't just in this place, it was in the accompanying Sultanate Bijapur that we see a lot of Africans who really were the prime ministers and the generals. And so we went through this in a sort of a casual way. The Abyssinian party uh, dominated under, uh, under the rule of the greatest Sultan Ibrahim Adil Shah, who was noted for, his, for being a great Rasika, esthete, musician, and so on. And during the reign of his followers, there was continued dominance by Africans, especially Ikhlas Khan of Wazirs, were also Africans. They constructed mosques and the tomb of Ibrahim Raza uh, and so on. And um, one city, Johar, assisted by another uh, Muslim general, Bashid Shivaji, and so on and so forth. And at last case, one of them uh, became semi-independent, though he was defeated and his kingdom was destroyed. So we have this whole list of very important Africans in Bishopur, and nobody has written a history of Africans in Bishopur. And Sidi Massoud was for a short time an independent ruler, and he had a great painting atelier, which was um, taken by one of the Mughal generals, the Maharaja of Bikanir, and was one of the starts of the great Bikanir painting collection, the artists that were taken from uh, Sidi Massoud's atelier. So that tells you a lot about uh, what was going on. But I'd like to go back, if we could, to mm. talk about, did Africans really belong here? Did they, how, were they, how were they seen? Were they, were, they, were they just outsiders? So I'd like to start with this painting, which is a painting of the prophet Joseph, Joseph to Christians and Jews. And uh, he is bathing in the Nile River, which is in Africa, in this Indian painting. And the only figure wearing Indian clothing in the whole painting, which is set in Africa, is the one African figure. He's wearing a Bishopur style, Af Indian style turban. So he was seen as an indigenous Indian by this artist who was probably in Kashmir, far away from where the wearers of this turban would have been living. It's very hard to sort out when somebody does something who's an African. And the question we always have to raise is, is if an African does something, does that make it African? Now, I'm looking at a painting from my collection, Bill Hapshu, we have two paintings by this painter. And from his name, Bilal, the first African disciple of Mohammed, and Hapshi meaning East African, we can pretty much assume that he was a, an African. And uh, if you look at this painting and try to distinguish it from paintings made by other Muslim artists and by Hindu artists in this set of paintings, they all look pretty much the same. You can't distinguish which are the Hindus and which are the Muslim painters in this set, which is particularly interesting because this is a book uh, Persian translation of the Mahabharata that was made in the Mughal court to try to make Hindus people of the book, people who could be accepted and didn't have to be converted or converted by force. Africans, and many of the harems, Muslim rulers. We know that this Sultan of Mandu, many African wives, and we assume that the ones that are African are the darkest ones whose faces are seen in three quarter know that, but it's a reasonable assumption. And the question is, how do you appear, appear is, what is the question of the skin color? Is I think so confusing, and we'll try to talk about that at the end here. But if you go back to the 13th century, you find that from 1236 to 1240, the Sultan of Delhi was ruled by a woman, Razia, and she had an African advisor. And according to a movie that was made, a popular movie, he may have been her lover, which I don't know is, well, that's historically accurate. But it's interesting how in this picture from the case of the movie, he's seen as being blue 
and I'll show you other pictures that are blue, you know, so how, how does blue come into the whole thing? It's even more interesting when you talk about, take a look at paintings. Now, this is, I, I mentioned before, Sidi Masood, and uh, this is a copy of a painting from the area where Sidi Masood was the prime minister. It's a copy of a slightly earlier painting. And the, the paintings of that place, Bijapur and Adani, were taken to Rajasthan. And this is a Rajasthani copy of that painting. Now, what's interesting about the painting is that there are four people here. The person on the left is Ikhlas Khan, the prime minister, African, and there's an African eunuch on the right. And the two figures in the center are not Africans. Very, so this talks to the question about how, about color and how we see color. You know, between 1486 and 1493, it's fascinating that there were Hapshi dynasties in Bengal. Right. Can you tell us about that? And what are some of the ways, you know, historians can identify their, their African origin? Yeah, I think this is the most interesting thing. They came as a uh, mercenary army overthrew the sultans in 1486. And we know about them mostly through the coins that they left with the names of four of these emperors. If they had been in the 16th century instead of the late 15th century, we probably would have paintings of them and know what they looked like. But unfortunately, they ruled too early for that, but the coins are there. And I like to say that when I talk about publicizing this, a new mysticist looked at me and said, well, everybody knows about that Africans ruled in Bengal. And I don't think that that's general information at all. And the question is, how are these things dealt with? So I thought I would take a painting that's now in the British Library and show you that they were defeated by a different dynasty. And uh, Nusrat Shah, the son of the man who deposed the Hapshi dynasty of Bengal, made some paintings. Now in this paintings, he doesn't have paintings of the previous dynasty, but he has paintings of Alexander the Great conquering legendary Africans called Zangis. It's almost as if he's saying that, talking about his dynasty being a continuation of Alexander the Great's dynasty, uh, and, as a world conqueror, and that uh, a generic African, they feed the generic Africans. But what's interesting about the, these people is that their faces are not black, their faces are blue. So what does this mean? What is the question of color here? And that's the theme that should come right through. We mentioned Malik Ambar, at the time Malik Ambar, the beginning of the 17th century, uh, Africans were riding high in terms of being an integral part of the uh, governments of Bishopur and Abed Nagar. They rose to great positions. And in the early 17th century, they were given an island fort. And from this island fort in the surrounding territory, they built a state built around naval power. Their fort was impregnable. It was attacked uh, about 3,000 times and never fell. At one point they gave the British in Bombay a bloody nose and they were riding high. The Mughals, which really had, who really had little or no naval presence, so they had great armies, uh, made them important admirals and brought them to Gujarat. So these people who are ruling this island fort and this thing, I don't know certain were as pirates, but they worked as Mughal admirals. And they were important in places like Surat and so on. And uh, they actually formed a dependency called Jafrabad, where they actually ruled over another part of the country in Gujarat. So they were an important figure. And uh, by the time the 19th century came, their mode of uh, naval warfare was outmoded and uh, they fell on bad times. But by the turn of the century, 20th century, they had built this magic new palace on the shore. And so in my book, this is one of the things that we talked about, this magic new palace. 
which had beautiful paintings in it, and it's an incredibly dreamy place. Moving to the current day situation, Dr. Robbins, communities of African descent are found throughout South Asia today in Gujarat, Hyderabad, Pakistan, Sri Lanka. Could you please talk to us about how these marginalized groups have confronted the challenges of sustaining community, identity, home, and belonging in the course of their lives here? I think it varies from place. To, first of all, most were Muslims or are Muslims. But we've documented communities that were Pentecostal. We also see that we've lost a number of places. By lost, I mean we don't really know what happened to these people. We do know that the Portuguese and the Dutch brought slaves to Kerala. Where is there such a community? The only trace that I found was a bizarre trace. I was walking on the street, I saw people lighting candles on the street and I said, what are they lighting candle to? And only to learn that there was this was to an African saint whose name they didn't know. They didn't know anything about him, but somehow he was a holy man and he was going to help them. So I didn't find the African community, but I found African saints. So these are the kind of bizarre stories that uh, we're dealing with. We don't see the continuity between these great military and political groups led by Malik Ambar and Nicholas Khan in the Deccati Sultanates and the current day communities. We're starting to think about this, but at the present time, it seems totally separated. And what this comes about is it gives us an idea of where this is in this paint, mogul painting of uh, Ahmedabad. One sees two distinct classes of Africans. We always think of Africans as lower class, you know, I mean, is that really true? I mean, why do we instinctively think that? You can see on the right hand with the typical African hat, poor African. On the right hand, you see these elite figures dressed quite differently. And we know at this time, we know who many of these people were and how important they were and how wealthy they were. So when we talk about this, we can't talk about this as a single group. So how are these things constructed and how is identity structured? These people have kept their African heritage and so on and so forth. And uh, on the right-hand side, we have the woman who is the head of the African community in Ahmedabad with a copy of my earliest book on Africans. On the left hand, you see my wife dancing with the Africans and they're breaking coconuts with their heads and uh, breathing out fire. And it, it, I must say dancing with them seem rather hazardous to me, uh, but I didn't get burned or hit by a coconut. But the coconuts didn't seem to bother them at all. So we see these communities and all over Gujarat, we see them strong in areas of Karachi, uh, for example. And we're trying to give as much information, individual information about each community and how it's different. I think that a lot of the impetus for what are the uh, identity of these people is by outside researchers, anthropologists, sociologists, and so on and so forth, who are bringing these people together and telling them that they all belong together as part of a pan-African diaspora. And that identity is being created. And in Gujarat, they're looking at themselves, uh, trying to get certain reservation benefits as scheduled tribes and so on and so forth and schedule the cast as well. It's all very confusing to me. But how fascinating that, um, you know, when you had traveled to Ahmedabad in, and met, um, you know, the head there of the community that she had a copy of your book. I mean, it's, you know, a testament to the impact that your work is having on the existing communities. I, I, I of course, it was very, it was a narcissist gratification, but I have to tell you what the story was. We walk in unannounced and she doesn't speak English. And we get into this room, which is very tiny, and her mother, who is shriveled up like a Egyptian mummy, is there. And next thing you know, half of the community is there with drums, these huge drums at children, and you can't move. It was like, it was like being in a Marx Brothers movie. Uh, and uh, they're playing a concert in the middle of everything. And I keep on asking her about the history. And finally, she takes out of her refrigerator which wasn't plugged in, my book, it says, if you want the answers, look in this book. 
So which talks about the responsibility that we have, which is that I don't claim that everything I'm telling you is true. I'm telling you what I found and each thing should serve as a way of looking further and further to see where it takes us. And I'm gonna get at the end, I hope to give you some examples of where research takes us from one place to another. Right. And you know, your, your work has also focused on how Africans had brought their music to India and their influence within the cultural sphere. Are you able to tell us about that and also the cross fertilization, jazz music and the music in South Asia? Yeah, I'd like to talk about that very much. Uh, one of the things we see in the paintings are these East African string instruments. And if one goes to the uh, Tagar Bhavagur in, uh, in Mumbai today and other Tagars, one finds the same exact kinds of instruments. So there is this transmission and they do perform these various dances, the Damo dances. I showed you a different sort of non-religious dance before uh, with the coconuts, but this is a more serious kind of religious dancing. So my thesis was to really talk about the African diaspora as a whole and how it's interacted. So we came up with any number of different ideas about this happening. I, as somebody who's interested in jazz, was particularly interested in that. The Ahmadiyya movement of the Punjab, advertising itself as Muslim, came to send missionaries to America, people like Mufti Muhammad Sadiq. And uh, one of the targeted communities was Blacks. And quite a number became uh, Muslim, taking Muslim names. Some became Ahmadiyya, like Yosef Latif, who was one of our greatest multi-read uh, musicians. And um, this Muslim influence, I think, is very, very important. But we can't really see it totally in terms of Muslim influence. The influence of India and of South Asia is there, too. So let's describe how this goes from one generation to the next. In the court of the Gekwa Baroda, there were several generations of the family of the musicians shown on the left. Uh, he supported them. They standardized music and recorded the, uh, some of the musical modes, of the uh, rugs, and so on and so forth. And this musician took off to America, uh, where he became Husrat Anayat Khan leader of a Sufi leader, and he wrote a book called The Universe is Sound. The Universe is Sound. This book is picked up by musicians like Yosef Latif, given to John Coltrane, one of our greatest saxophone players, who then takes up this idea of the universe is sound. He also gets involved as a friend with Ravi Shankar, and after John Coltrane's death, his wife, who's a pianist and harpist, becomes a Hindu guru, and follow Sasha Dananda. So we can see how things go from one to one place to, to another. And that isn't the only place where you see this kind of interaction. Um, one example would be the effect of transcendentalists and other Americans on Gandhi. And then American blacks coming on pilgrimage of friendship like Howard Thurman to create visions of a better world by their visits to Gandhi. And so during the Montgomery bus strike, it said that Martin Luther King carried uh, the book by Howard Thurman, who was one of his mentors, a book called Jesus and the Disinherited. So we can see the, uh, the idea of the, the knowledge coming back and forth and this cross-fertilization of people of African descent with other people of color is one that has been an important part of the whole history. Mm -hmm. And so we see it going back to the early and mid 19th, mid 20th century between the contact between W.E.B. Du Bois in America and the Dalit leader on Bedkar. We have any number of people coming like Max Jurgen and uh, C.H. Tobias, black clergyman from America to head the YMCA's, and then back in America 
working for Indian freedom during World War II with Paul Robeson and, and so on. So this goes back and forth. I think the, the cross fertilization between the Indian independence movement and the black freedom movement is, is fascinating. And uh, you know, Howard Thurman's visit to India you know, him taking the whole idea of peaceful protest, a nonviolent approach, had a huge impact on uh, the Selma March and uh, even through Barrett Rustin, who found inspiration through Gandhian, um, you know, practices. We see that reflected in the March on Washington as well, which and that civil rights movement you know, the South Asians that migrated to the U.S. directly benefited from that too. So there's this deeply rooted sort of tie between, I think, the two communities, which deserves a lot of attention and study as well. I think it's important that these things come to the fore. And I think the question uh, that we're still tackling of uh, relationships and marriages between people from South Asia and, and Blacks, I think, is an important uh, part of this. This was something that was envisioned uh, first by W.E.D.B. Du Bois in a novel that he wrote, an important but forgotten novel uh, that he wrote. And now, of course, we have uh, um, somebody who is vice president of the United States. We don't even know what to call her in this day when everybody has an identity. We have all these people who, who transcend identity in mm -hmm. some way and yet embody that identity at the same time. It's wonderful that they can do both. Absolutely. I think, you know, African South Asian communities in today's world often, you know, interact in completely separate spaces as minorities. What lessons do you think can be drawn from history and these findings that historians like you, you know, come up with and, and bring to the fore? What lessons can be taken from these sorts of inter historical interactions between the two communities? I think that some of the problems that uh, you know, we've talked about should not be taken as essential. And, um, you know, and that there are a lot of areas where people can work together. And um, you know, whether we're talking about uh, politics or economics or something else, if we could find the areas where people have commonalities, regardless of who those people are, and bring them together, I think we'll all be better off. And, um, you know, we're just starting to see these things and how, how things are, get influenced by these things. For example, if Gandhi had never gone to South Africa and be politicized, would he have been the Gandhi who was so great? And if we look at his early history and in the book I have coming out about Gujarat, I look at his family history and his siblings and his ancestors and their takes, you can see the Indian roots, the Gujarati roots of nonviolence as well and by the violent protest. It didn't come just from outside. So that was reinforced, but also his, his experiences uh, in India uh, with prejudice and his relationship with a Lithuanian Jew name really crystallized the whole thing. And that never would have happened if he hadn't had to go to India, mm -hmm. from India to Africa. And the things that people bring back are also important. Um, if we looked at the community of Indians from Gujarat, one sees uh, all sorts of interesting, especially from Kutch, which at one point was considered a place apart from Gujarat, but now part of Gujarat, uh, of the Africans who experienced the Indians who came not only from Kutch, but also from Oman and uh, related to, to the whole society that was built in Zanzibar and so on and so forth. And this is a much more contentious issue and we need to sort this out away from the momentary political considerations. And that's why I think this thing, of my, one of my favorite pieces in my collection is this uh, icon of St. George, obviously drawn by a 17th century Indian painter that was once in the Ethiopian Royal Court. How did it get to the Ethiopian Royal Court? And why is it now we're finding all sorts of interesting things that had nothing to do with Europeans because we have things that are even earlier that could not have been brought by Europeans 
uh, such as Deccany Shields uh, in Ethiopian churches. That an, so what was the connection between India and Africa be, even before the Europeans came there? And then we have to discuss the period after they came there, the way in which people became citizens of the British empire or the various empires so that people wound up across the globe in Mauritius and Trinidad and places like that. And even in uh, Suriname, which was a Dutch colony, one sees this multicultural thing from South Asia. And the question of how are people seeing this color of racism color? And I think that that's what we should focus on a little bit. This is probably not a picture of Africans, but this is probably, we're not really sure, a Japanese propaganda uh, card, anti-British during World War II. And the Indians are drawn. If you saw it anywhere else, you'd say that they were Africans. So did, was this just one outside group that saw it in these terms? I don't think so. Um, we have the same question about how people look and does that make them African or not African? The, uh, one of the two oldest examples of Indian sculpture is this dancing girl. Is she African or not African? And on the left, we have a painting of Ramayana that was made in Bengal for the wife of uh, the Chief Justice, Elijah Impey. You can see that the uh, Bengali boatmen are drawn as if they were black. They're not meant to be Africans at all. Yeah, and I think the constructions of race and color through these paintings are really interesting. That brings me to the two amazing stories, the Africans at the court of the Nawabs of Awad and the actress Zubeda as well, who was a daughter of the Hapshi Nawab of Sachin. Are you able to tell us about those uh, two very interesting stories? Well, it, it came about in this way. Um, this is a book that was made, a love book that was made for Wajid Ali Shah, the last ruling a reigning Nawab of uh, Lucknow. And you can see he has, there's an African woman, one of his concubines or wives and an African eunuch in the thing. So it all came about in a very strange way. When I did my first book, I didn't know anything about Africans. In, and I found this painting that supposedly, supposedly was found. And uh, must be Africans there. I'm gonna to start to look for Africans. Well, before you know it, uh, working with uh, under uh, Rosie Llewellyn Jones, who knows everything about the history of Lucknow, found that there was an African cavalry regiment. There were African female bodyguards. There were female guardians of the fairy house of the, uh, where all his plays and his concubines were. There was a eunuch in charge of the fairy house who also commanded two regiments and built a shrine to Karbala. And there were African soldiers in charge of the royal household. And um, that when the Nawab's army was disbanded and the Africans joined the rebellion, uh, one particular one was Bob the Nailer, who was known as a sniper. And there were African women soldiers. And that's a whole different thing that we're opening up. So this brings us to, there were Africans there. I mean, who was this African wife? Well, I had an African, I had a name for her, Zenit Maha. So I published this as Zenit Mahal. And to my chagrin, when the queen has the picture published, she says, no, it's, it's not Zenit Mahal, it's Hazrat Mahal. Excuse me, Hazrat Mahal is one of the most important heroines of the War of Independence, leading the troops and so on and so forth. She's never seen as an African. Well, if you look at the pictures of her, she's definitely African and uh, Rosie Llewellyn Jones certifies that her father was in fact an African. So how was she, how was she deconstructed as not being an African? Uh, is it only when we see pe people in negative terms as slaves or as, uh, you know, as poor people or in some sort of a negative criminal thing, do we see them as Africans? Do they cease being Africans if, if they're not doing things? I mean, this is, this is an entirely racist concern that I have, um, that, uh, you know, how can we let this, this sort of racism stand? 
you know, the racial arrogance that was seen um, back then, and, and in some ways, it's, it's still kind of continued. Any sort of depiction we see of African elites, be it a queen or a ruler or a general, it's really kind of depicted in a different light. And I mean, you can see this image of, of the queen, and, and she clearly on the image to the left looks like she's Indian. And clearly she's not. So the constructions of race and color then becomes, you know, a recurring issue that we need to talk about. Um, so I think it's really important to look at these artifacts and paintings and understand our history. Now, what we see is a painting from the Nawabs of Sachin. And I should tell you a little bit about Sachin. Mm -hmm. I mentioned Janjira, which was ruled by Africans. And in the late 18th century, there were a number of claimants to rule the place. And one of them sold his right, his claim to the Marathas in return for land near Surat. So he no longer got Janjira, which uh, you know was in present day Maharashtra. He got a piece of Gujarat and he started this new kingdom. And you can see in this thing, it was made by the family. He's not seen as, as Bilu, uh, Ayan is not seen as African at all. This is the family saying. So you say, well, what did the family think about this whole thing? I don't think the family had any problem with it. They're proud to call themselves East Africans. And if you ask members of the family, they will tell you that to Muslims, they are uh, Muslims from East Africa, like Muslims come from Persia or some other place. And uh, to non-Muslims, they are seen as Muslim. They don't make this distinction that their, their primary uh, identity is as Africans, even though they came from East Africa, and they're proud of that. Their, their primary identity is as, as Muslims. Now, Sachin was a relatively small place, but as you can see, they, uh, it was a very sophisticated place. In the 19th century, members of the royal family were already lawyers. Um, the father of the present Nawab, when he was Nawab himself, was an anesthesiologist. The present Nawab is a lawyer. Um, these are, you know, pretty intelligent and articulate people. And you can see their, their fiscal stamps and their uh, badges and so on and so forth. Well, so here's what the investiture on the throne, the Masnid, in 1930 would have been. Now this ruler's half sister was an actress. His father had a long-term relationship with a non-African Muslim who was one of the pioneering directors and actresses in Indian movies in the 1920s. And their daughter was Zubeda. So this is, so we know that Zubeda's father was of African origin. And here she is as she appeared in the movie. And here are some of the other images of her. My favorite being the one on the right where she appears to be a white woman who's menaced by a dark villain in blackface. So this construction of race and color uh, is, is really a very important part of our dealing with Indian and uh, South Asian history. Because there are dangers of a single narrative, I think it's so important and imperative for one to understand the Afro-South Asian history. But there seems to be such a great disconnect here and the ways in which Africa is imagined or perceived. And the story of Black folks in general is often that of struggle and strife and enslavement. So the rediscovering of Africa and African history becomes extremely crucial. This is really important work you're doing. How um, do you think we can revive an interest on the topic to help rectify some of these misconceptions? I think that the most important thing that you said is that, uh, is the, that single narratives are very dangerous because they they usually have some element of truth or a lot of truth in them. Uh, we can't really tell the history of Africa without talking about slavery. How can we do that? Mm -hmm. it's, it's a fact. 
On the other hand, if we tell it, if we see people from Africa only as victims, but not as people who could accomplish anything, and we consider this extraordinary, it's not extraordinary. And I think that this is where there were two aspects that I brought out in the third volume. One is that music and the way in which black musicians have come across the globe and created all these different types of music and their influence on local music talks about the creativity of black people. What I'm trying to also do is to bring the question about, um, you know, if, if I want to talk about black athletes in India, I could have done that. And, you know, maybe I should have done that. Uh, we did mention it in passing, but I wanted to bring out the importance of black religious leaders, Muslim and Christian across the centuries and across the world coming together. And so I wanted, so if there was a, an important evangelical missionary who came to India, who was born a slave and only a basic, a basic ministry was to the British elite in India, you should know that. Was she typical of everything? No, but she was a very important but forgotten figure in American uh, evangelism in the 19th century. But there were all these people who headed YMCA's. And what was also true is that they weren't stick figures. You said something very important when you talked about narratives. One of the important things about talking about people like Max Jurgen, who was a very famous man in his time, who's now totally forgotten, is the way he transformed the Max Jurgen of 1920s was not the Max Jurgen of the 1940s or 50s. And I disagree with some of the ways in which he transformed himself uh, because there was, again, it, that was not what you would expect would happen. But I think that we have to say that black people have the freedom to go in any direction they want and to develop. And I think the importance of stories like the story of Malcolm X is the way that the Malcolm X of any period of time is not the same as the Malcolm X of five years later. Mm -hmm. And we have to see people not as stick figures who don't change, but as people who are capable of development. Dr. Robbins, that is a very, very important point. You know, African and South Asian communities in today's world often interact in completely separate spaces as minorities. And I think great lessons can be drawn from history of how our cultures were shaped by one another. So I thank you, Dr. Robbins, for the fascinating work you've been doing. You've thank done you for all your work. This is amazing. So I thank you for the fascinating work you've done on the series, for sharing the most interesting historical facts and events from your vast research and in helping us in, in understanding today more deeply about the ties between Africa and South Asia. Thank you so much. Thank you. Over the course of the next several weeks, in addition to the virtual exhibition, there will be a series of webinars, interviews, art talk, content and resources to spark meaningful dialogue around issues of race, identity, and power. To stay updated on the events to come, please sign up for our e-newsletter on www.theblackstory.com. Proceeds from the Black Story Project will go towards BIPOC CA, Black and Indigenous People of Color Creative Association. I thank you for joining us today, and we hope you'll tune in for upcoming webinars. I was born by the river In a little tent And oh, just like that river I've been running Ever since It's been a long, long time coming But I know a change's gonna come Oh, yes it will